in association with the Mekong Tourism Coordinating Office, Travel Mall welcomes you to part two of our webcast series for an update on coronavirus tourism recovery. My name is Charles Kao. I'm the publisher of Travel Mall, currently in France, but also based in Los Angeles. The coronavirus situation and how governments and their communities and the different industry sectors are reacting and planning for recovery differ from region to region, country to country. Today, our distinguished panel will be updating us on the whole Mekong region by travel sector, followed by questions from our audience. Our first webcast last month provided updates by country, including Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Myanmar, Laos, and China which make up the greater Mekong sub-region. It included Mr. Jens Trenghart, Executive Director of Mekong Tourism Coordinating Office, providing an overview about his office's function to coordinate the development of sustainable tourism amongst his member countries. All of you should have received a link to the recording of the first webcast for viewing if you missed it. Jens, can you please introduce our distinguished panel and the tourism sectors that will be updating us about today? Great, thank you so much, Charlie. Uh, I'm uh, Jens Treinhardt, the Executive Director of the Mekong Tourism Coordinating Office. And uh, it's, I'm actually excited to say that I'm calling in from um, Southern Thailand, uh, Suratani from uh, Kaosak National Park. Uh, from the beautiful Anurag Lodge. Uh, we've kind of moved our office for uh, three days down here uh, to, on one hand, experience domestic tourism in Thailand, uh, which uh, actually is quite active. And number two, also uh, to support, obviously, um, uh, tourism and experience how tourism is working domestically. So, I mean, I can report this is a uh, fabulous experience. Um, the flight down here from Bangkok was... Uh, uh, actually very uh, seamless and, and, and painless and the experience here in the National Park is just fantastic. Um, so um, it, it's a pleasure to calling in from here and uh, it's also a pleasure to introduce the, um, um, the fellow panelists. I'll, I'll start with uh, His Excellency uh, Ute Yong, the, the former Minister of Hotels and Tourism of, of Myanmar who is a very active member of our Mekong Tourism Advisory Group that we have formed um, back in March at the beginning of the, uh, um, the crisis and, and the, uh, the travel restrictions to really bring the tourism industry together and, and to kind of start conversations between the public and the private sector. Um, next, we also have um, uh, Kun Chatan, uh, who is the Deputy Governor of the Tourism Authority of Thailand who well, I'm sure is very happy that I'm actually traveling domestically in Thailand uh, right now, and also a very active supporter and, and uh, a member of our Mekong Tourism Advisory Group. Um, uh, and also we have Mr. Nick Ray, a longtime friend uh, uh, who is based in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, uh, who is the um, director of Hanuman Travel and Hanuman Films, and also the author of many Lonely Planet guidebooks uh, in, in the Mekong region, including, I think, Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, uh, and, and, and probably a few other ones as well, doing a lot of work with other entities from BBC uh, and, and, and uh, film productions uh, like the Angelina Jolie film. So, so someone who is very knowledgeable about the region. Um, quickly about our office, uh, we um, are owned um, by the six uh, governments of the Mekong uh, Greater Mekong sub-region, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, and the People's Republic of China. Uh, we are a uh, tourism collaboration in the region to really, uh, uh, on one hand, you know, promote the region as a single tourism destination, to uh, build capacity, and uh, also to work with the public and the private sector to create experiences and, and promote experiences, especially when it comes to sustainable and responsible tourism. Uh, we have created various uh, initiatives uh, over the last few years. One that becomes very relevant right now is the Experience Mekong Collection, where we actually curated 
uh, over 350 small responsible travel businesses and social enterprises. Uh, and now we kind of form that into a, uh, a, an alliance of these businesses that really help each other to kind of get through this, uh, this uh, difficult time. Um, one initiative that I'd also like to mention is our destination Mekong Summit, um, which is a virtual summit that we're August, uh, organizing on August 25th. Um, and we have a great program there. It's a half day forum. And uh, all actually uh, the panelists that are on this call, they're also speakers at that summit as well. And um, you can register for free at uh, destinationmekong.com forward slash DMS 20. Uh, so with that, I'd, I'd like to turn it over back to, to Charlie. And again, want to thank Charlie as well for organizing uh, these calls. I think we have a great partnership with Travel Mall and I think it's important for the, um, the travel trade uh, to learn and, and get informed about the situation in Southeast Asia and the greater Mekong sub-region. Finally, I'd like to also kind of mention quickly uh, uh, Kun Ton, my uh, operations manager, who is here with me in Kawasaki uh, as well at the Anurag Lodge. And, and again, we've been moving our office here to kind of do some remote working uh, away from Bangkok for a few days. Thank you, Charlie. Back to you. Yes, before uh, we let you go, turn your laptop around so we could see that scenery behind you, please. Wow. Oh yeah, we, we're in a special place right now, which I'm sure uh, Kun Chatan can, uh, can endorse and, uh, and verify. Uh, before I let you go and, and uh, go to our panel, can you give us an update, Jens, on the key coronavirus-related developments in the region for the past month, including travel restrictions by country? Have they changed much? I don't think so. <laughs> Still restricted. Sure, I'd, I'd actually like to, to ask uh, uh, Kun Ton to, to give an update because what we've been doing, and it's a project that he's leading, is we uh, every around three weeks or so, we're updating an infograph uh, that summarizes the different travel restrictions in the region. It's one of his projects. And actually, just today, uh, we um, uh, published our, I think, fifth infograph uh, of travel restrictions in the region. So maybe, uh, uh, Kun Ton, if you can give us the highlights of the, the infographs that you published today. Sure. Thank you so much, Jens, for, for handing over to me. Uh, so yes, to, to answer, to address your question, Charlies, I mean, at the moment, it's true that uh, most of countries in the region are still, I mean, bad, the, the, the travel. Basically, for example, like Myanmar just extend the flight, international flight arrival until August 31st. And also, of course, right now, Vietnam is still ban the international travel as you all might know that they, they have a second wave of, of, of infection in, in, in Da Nang and in Hanoi as well. And also, of course, Thailand just kind of like launched that they, they still ban most of the travel, international travel, but some conditions they i mean allow some some groups of i mean like the the travelers get in the to the country with measurement in place and also the rest is almost the same like laos and and cambodia still ban the the travel uh, i mean like the international travel but but in case in cambodia there are some risk uh, conditions that they can arrive like nick mentioned before that the three thousand dollars deposit is one of the policy from Cambodia. Yes, this is quite just kind of like the, the key snapshot for for the region as well. Thank you. I, I should wish to add that the coronavirus infection rate in the Mekong countries have been very low, the reported ones, up until recent couple of weeks. Uh, I was a skeptic of those numbers, low numbers. But as I read more about why the infection rate is so low compared to pretty much anywhere else in the world, uh, I now believe them. And so when uh, 
Kung Tong mentioned about the reinfection in Vietnam. <laughs> Let's put that in perspective. Uh, <laughs> that reinfection is very low. Uh, you know, we're not talking anything like Texas or Florida or, or, or the other places. We're talking in, in under 100, right? Uh, people, yeah. So it's, that's, uh, let's get started on what are governments now doing policy-wise and how they are helping tourism enterprises. And I'd like to ask Kung Chatan uh, to give us an update on the region and or Thailand, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Charles. Uh, anyway, uh, hello to everyone. Uh, I know uh, it's been a long year already, <laughs> but uh, you know, let's uh, hang in there, right? Uh, brighter days ahead. The same can be said for Thailand. Um, I've been attending these COVID-19 national meetings, uh, sometimes more than once a week. And, uh, you know, we, we've been discussing the re eventual reopening of the country. Uh, let me get straight to the point. Uh, so far, there has not been a discussion of opening the country for leisure travel, whether that's uh, ties going overseas or overseas tourists coming in. There has been no mention of a timeline for that, okay? Um, having said that, like Pinton said, there has been uh, an approval for some groups to come into Thailand on a very controlled basis, meaning that these groups when they come in, they will have to be in alternate state quarantine or state quarantine. The, the difference being state quarantine is, of course, uh, arranged by the government uh, in predetermined, uh, usually hotels, okay, that are, are in the program. Alternate state quarantines, there are some more hotels, but you have to pay extra. Of course, the, the standard is different with alternate state quarantine, uh, uh, somewhat higher, but you are nonetheless uh, required to stay in SQ, state quarantine, or ASQ, alternate state quarantine, for 14 days for evaluation. Okay, uh, the groups that have been allowed in, the latest groups that have been allowed in, include film crews, include Thailand elite card members, include exhibition uh, personnel, you know, international exhibitions, and, and so on. Uh, and then, of course, there are the, your normal groups of diplomats, uh, UN officials, uh, some private sector people, uh, businessmen, investors that have an agreement with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Okay. Uh, at the moment, there are four countries plus one territory like that. They are that, that have agreements with, with the MFA. They are Japan, South Korea, Singapore, China, plus Hong Kong. So that makes four plus one, okay? But also every single one of them, even diplomats, even on those, uh, those coming for foreign missions, they will have to go into quarantine, okay? Uh, with normal travel, like I said, there has been no discussion uh, last month, there was a lot of talk about the so-called travel bubble uh, with certain countries. That talk now has not uh, been continued uh, so far, okay, uh, because there was a case with uh, a soldier, a foreign soldier in Rayong province on the eastern seaboard. And then there are, of course, as you guys know, there are outbreaks, uh, what, what is called the second wave in so many countries that we were hoping to get tourists from in these uh, travel bubble schemes, including, uh, unfortunately, Vietnam, okay, uh, which has seen like a really fresh dose of, of outbreaks. So uh, 
that is uh, not being discussed in earnest, let, let me put it this way, okay? However, what we have proposed and we will make our effort to propose uh, for the initial groups of uh, foreign tourist arrivals to come will be at least, uh, they will, will, will that they stay at least 30 days. This is advocated by the Thai doctors in the COVID-19 committee, which is a really interesting case because uh, thing, because originally we, we proposed that tourists don't stay a long time. You know, just come and go, do whatever they need to do, three, four days max, and then just leave. Doctors see, see things very, very differently. They want people to stay here at least 30 days to evaluate and be, be contained in a certified or designated area, probably on islands. For example, for 30 days, you have to stay on Phuket. You have to stay on Kosamui. You have to stay on PP, for example. However, this, this proposal is not moving forward at the moment because they're, they're, the government, understandably, is taking a wait and see attitude. Okay, they will. They told me. They told TAT they want to see how the current groups of foreigners do first. You know how the businessmen are doing, uh, how the diplomats they're allowed uh, uh, are doing, how the film crews, no problems. If there are no problems, then they will consider uh, opening the country to a select group of tourists, probably, at, like I said, a uh, 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 minimum of 30 days, and then they'll, they'll, they'll see, they'll take it from there. So understandably, uh, gentlemen, uh, and ladies, if there are any, uh, we are taking a very, very cautious approach, okay? And uh, also, there's a lot of local sentiment that is, well, to be very frank, opposing the, uh, the, the in, inbound tourists uh, coming to Thailand, okay? So there's, there's still a lot of nervousness, okay? Now, Having said that, uh, the government, what they're doing, okay, to, to answer your question, Charles, what they're doing to help the tourism industry, well, it's basically just boost and boost domestic travel. There is no other way, okay? So there's a lot of schemes in the news uh, just to maybe boost domestic travel uh, with I won't go into details because I, 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 some, some of the schemes I, do, I really don't understand, but it's a scheme where it's a, like a cashback uh, scheme where you pay certain, a certain amount under certain conditions, but then you, at the end of your trip, you, you get some refunds or some cashbacks or something like that. So that is being done uh, very uh, aggressively. Also, and this is under my command now, uh, I, I have the task of promoting expats who are stranded or stuck or choose to be here in Thailand to get to traveling within the country. Okay, so uh, basically it's Thais travel within Thailand, expats travel within Thailand, but also we have to get everything ready for the eventual opening, which I, I don't know that will be. Uh, at the current rate, Charles and 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 the, the team, we if we don't open this year, you know, if we remain close to inbound travel until December thirty first, we expect uh, we won't get more than seven million tourists all year, okay, which is a big drop off from nearly fourteen million last year, if you can imagine, okay. If we open late. Okay, let's say we open for some travel, travel bubble or not, we might get up to nine, but that is uh, really the maximum we are hoping to get. Okay, uh, at this moment, I, I see no signal from the government that the country will, will open this year. Okay, uh, so that is putting a lot of pressure on the tourism industry here. The Christmas period, the winter 
you know, usually high season period is now in jeopardy. And now I, I'm looking all the way to even Chinese New Year in February, which is uh, an iffy proposition at best now. Okay, so uh, unfortunately, not a rosy picture, but that's the way it is. And uh, well, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Kun Chatan. It's strikingly amazing how Thailand, and, and I think that what you described uh, applies to many other countries, Mekong region countries, how you are managing uh, the potential infection of allowing visitors from higher infected countries. And I, again, use that expression very loosely because what you define as highly infected, I mean, when you're speaking about Malaysia, Indonesia not included, I mean, their infection rate compared to the Western world is low, low, low. But let's uh, call on Mr. Ung, who please uh, to give us not only uh, an overview about the region, but also share with us what Myanmar is doing uh, specifically as far as the strategy is concerned. Uh, Mr. Ong. Yes. Uh, thank you. Can you hear? Absolutely. Can you? Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Charles, uh, according to my presentation, it can be classified into two parts, which represents overview of governments in the first part, and then we will go to the second part for Myanmar in specific. So regarding the governments, sincerely, they all are trying their best with the concerted efforts to get back to the normal state. But there is a disparity among the countries across the globe and in the GMS as well. The thing is that mostly are developing nations which are not able to do like other developed nations around the, around the world. So since the pandemic came to the region and the whole world with great impact, everyone has suffered from it in terms of health, job, income, social welfare, stress, depression, and so on. So in this circumstance, all the government across the globe have realized the situation and taking their responsibility to support the citizens in their own capacity. In my understanding, all governments around the globe are focusing their efforts on preparing comprehensive tourism recovery plans, meaning to rebuild destination, encourage innovation and investment in line with new normal ways new normal ways. Most of them have regulatory reform to local tourism businesses in order to prevent business collapse and stimulate much needed economic recovery. Governments are Im implementing in different types of measures and different volumes of capacity in supporting the survival and revival. But in principle, governments have introduced an precedented measures on prevention, containment and treatment, and also supporting stimulus packages to businesses for the survival of the economy. More importantly, the governments need to consider longer term implications of the crisis. The crisis is an opportunity to rethink tourism for future, to build a stronger, more sustainable and resilient tourism economy. The measures put in place today will shape tourism tomorrow. For the survival of tourism sector, lifting travel restrictions and working with businesses to assess liquidity supports, apply new health protocols for safe travel and help to diversify the markets. Restoring travel confidence and stimulated demand with new safe and clean labors for the sector, information applications for visitors and domestic tourism promotion campaign 
are also in the crucial part to be supported by the governments. In fact, the balanced tourism recovery for this pandemic needs cooperation, coordination, and collaboration of not only the intra-government sectors, but also all tourism-related private associations and concerned communities. Otherwise, all the plans could be delayed or unsuccessful. So let me go to the slides huh, to show about Myanmar. The slides are up. Yes. Yes, this is the first one. It's good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Charles. So when you're looking at the first slide, this is just, just the, what we call it, it, it's, it is a short form. So we are going to get into the roadmap, which three stages. First stage represents self-finance and stimulus, you know, uh, which will be, which has been done from April to June 20, 2020. And then second stage is reopening, which covers relaxing quarantine from January to August 2020. Then the third part is the relaunching, which means reinventing Myanmar tourism and relaxing of regulations, which will be lasting from August to January 2021. We hope that after these stages <clears throat> are finished, we will see the positive hope for the country and for the region as well. So this is what we intend to do with our own capacity. Thank you. Thank you, all my friends. Thank you. Thank you for that. Moving on to Corona, virus issues related to the hotel and uh, resort sector. Uh, NT, what have been implemented? What have they tried? What have they had to adjust as a result from their experiences? How is the sector and the hospitality workers coping with the drop in tourism? Yeah, I mean, the COVID in Laos is, uh, if, if, if you're talking about the number, is, is, is quite small. Of course, I think we, uh, the, 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 we start to close everything down, lockdown during uh, end of March until sometime in the beginning of May. So everything starts opening up again, but I think the hotel industry in, in Laos, most likely in the area like Long Prabang, Long Rieng, or the South, Park Se, is relating a lot to a foreign tourist. So of course, I think we are all suffering a lot. Uh, but in the same time, when the country opening up again, uh, the local people who used to travel, and they're also looking for some place to go, and, and, and that is the time uh, where the place like the, uh, nearby the capital city, where the most of the market is, uh, Wang Wei and Long Prabang, I think the hotel, we, we have to survive by dropping down the price quite a lot. I think most of us, we drop the price down to 70%. In Long Prabang, even some of the hotel up to 80% just to get the local tourists uh, to attract them, to, to, to make sure that, okay, I mean, our employee have some, some work uh, because most of us, we want to keep the staff, which is not easy to find in Laos. Uh, in terms of human resources. So yeah, we, uh, so it's, it's getting a bit better now compared to the time when it's locked down because the domestic tourists start to travel around. And uh, luckily, I think we ending up the number in the 19 uh, people that had the uh, COVID. And we just have lately, we have one Korean that just happening again. And of course, now the government start to announce another, uh, like the, those uh, like karaoke, discotheque start to close again because of the case last week uh, with one of the Korean. Oh. No charter flight, yeah. Okay. Amazing, amazing. 
Uh, in, in terms of the region as a whole, is, is that, uh, how different is it uh, from the country to country? Is that about the same? I mean, are the hotels in Thailand, are they dropping 80% uh, for the local domestic tourists? Uh, you, you uh, yes, yes they are, sorry, yes. For Thailand, that's, that's, that's true. Uh, Laos, uh, I don't know. Go ahead. Please. Yeah, yeah. Laos, uh, 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 NT said they were dropping 70, 80 percent. And Myanmar, what's, uh, how much are the hotels dropping rates? Yeah, same, same, same as uh, Laos. All just the situations are very similar to each other. Huh? So just enough to cover operating expenses and keep the employees uh, employed. Very good. Nick, moving on to media, how and to what extent can the media drive confidence and trust in the region? And, and what would be the message now versus later? Yeah, thanks, Charlie. I mean, looking at the media for me, I mean, I'd look at it in sort of three different sections. There's sort of global international media, the travel media, and then local media within the Mekong region. If we start with international big media, I mean, I think they've played both a positive and negative role. I think on the positive side, you know, covering what's happening in the Mekong region has been very good because, of course, it is a good news story. Infection rates have been very low. Death rates have been negligible, in some cases zero, like Cambodia and Laos. But even in countries like Thailand, with a huge modern city like Bangkok, which is really like a very much a first world city, we've seen only 56 deaths in Thailand. That's quite incredible, really. You know, that's in many countries, that's happening many times over per day. So I think the story in the Mekong is very positive, and that's been given good coverage by some uh, big media players. You know, I've read articles in The Economist, why is the Mekong doing so well? Uh, New York Times, BBC, CNN. So that's where, where big media has done a good, good job of, of showing uh, how positive things have been in the Mekong. On the other hand, I think it's also played something of a negative role because um, obviously it's become so obsessed with the coronavirus and the COVID-19 story. Obviously a pandemic, once in a century, once in a generation, there's no hiding from it. But if you look at certain news outlets like The Guardian and so on, it's almost the coronavirus times. And I think people, there's a certain saturation people can, can have with this because of course it's important, but at the same time is, you know, it can't overtake everything in the world. And I think I was thinking earlier, we we're talking about you know, health versus economy. And it's very difficult for governments to get that balance right. And if you look at how most countries have handled the pandemic, it's been through a method called behavioral change theory, where they've needed to scare people or shock people into certain behavior very fast to try and contain the spread. And that works very well. And obviously, led to a, a drop in infection rates in many Western countries. But at the same time, it's hard to undo that behavior once it's ingrained in people's psyche and people are understandably nervous. And so to get economies going again, to get the travel industry going again, becomes quite hard. And that moves on to how can the travel media play a role in this? Well, I think the important thing is not to give up you know, to keep a positive message out there. It's, it must be very difficult to be a travel editor right now. You know, you'd probably be terminally depressed. But, you know, to keep the good stories out there, to keep pumping out content, you know, they might, a lot of editors have got piles of old content that they haven't run yet. Run the positive stories, uh, run some good news stories, some videos, some photos, maybe get readers to write in with their favorite trips, their favorite memories. Where would you like to be right now in the world if you could be? You know, just think positively. I know a lot of media outlets are under budget constraints and some travel publications are under threat. You know, it's particularly print um, is very difficult at the moment. Obviously, I know personally working for Lonely Planet, you know, they've had a lot of uh, harsh cutbacks in the last few months. And of course, some of the titles may be very delayed because bookshops don't want to order new editions. And of course, that makes it difficult because the content is aging before it's even published. So anyone in travel publishing and travel writing is certainly uh, finding it a very difficult period right now. But of course, we know eventually it will rebound because people do love to travel. Um, so I think, yeah, travel media, it's really keeping messages out there, maybe withdrawing print in the short term, pushing digital getting more uh, video content out and using local networks where you can, you know, travel content doesn't all have to come from London, from New York, from Paris. 
it can come from networks of people like, you know, Jens in Bangkok, myself in Phnom Penh, all our, you know, we've all got contacts all over the world in destinations with very capable local digital creators, writers, photographers, and so on. So maybe reworking the model that you don't have to fly journalists out from London or New York, you can look at local content sourcing in the region and get good quality content there. And then finally, moving on to kind of local media, I think local media, again, play a good and bad role. I think, uh, you know, looking at Cambodia, for example, I think in a way, again, there's that obsession with coronavirus. You know, you visit the Khmer Times website, it's like there's a coronavirus kind of daily update. You know, we've now got 240 cases. Big deal. Sorry to say, that's not bad. Zero deaths, 240 cases. You know, as we've said, maybe there's a, a regional town in England that's having more than that per day. We've only had 240 over five months. So I think, you know, there, there is this obsessiveness about coronavirus. And in the meantime, we're living with malaria, uh, tuberculosis, you know, cancer and all these other diseases. That's not to undermine the, 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 the horrible impact that coronavirus is having on many countries and many communities. But in countries of the Mekong, we have other problems to think about. You know, we have poverty, we have other diseases, we have other issues. So let's not obsess over one particular virus that has not actually done that much damage in our region to date and think about the other existing problems we have. And then going back to finally what local media I think can do, I think they can also encourage domestic travel. You know, uh, colleagues in Thailand and Myanmar talk about domestic travel. At the moment, domestic is all we've got, whether it's local tourists, whether it's expats, that's all we've really got right now and probably for the next two to three months at least. So really encourage that, you know, the newspapers, the magazines, the websites. We've got a very nice campaign running in Cambodia at the moment called The Road Home, which is supported by Savai TV. And it's amazing drone footage and, and video footage from all over Cambodia being shot by local crews here. And it's basically a a call to action for Cambodians and residents to get out there. You know, it's a beautiful country and many Cambodians haven't seen as much of it as foreign tourists. Why? Because they often jump on a plane somewhere else. So Cambodians with money are going to Singapore or Bangkok or Hong Kong or London or New York. Now they can't go. So it's time to see their own backyard. And that means that even higher end businesses that you think might struggle, like a Songsa private island, a Six Senses Kokra Bay, with the right kind of promotions, they can actually tap into that domestic tourism market because there is money in the Mekong. There's a very successful middle and upper class in all the Mekong countries, and they've got spending power. And if they're not traveling overseas, let's channel that spending back home and make sure there's a, a kind of patriotic call to action to get out there and visit every every province every destination in each of the respective countries thank you for that nick now for the questions from our audience we have quite a few interesting ones uh first one is from bernard in the united states he works for ifc international finance corporation senior industry specialists this question, with 2020 recovery now probably off the table for most destinations, what are your predictions for return to 2019 numbers? Any, anybody with, with some thoughts on that? Kuntatan, any, what, what do people think in Thailand uh, is, uh, returning to pre-COVID pre numbers. Yeah. So, uh, total guess, huh? What, what, okay. In, in 2021, whatever numbers we get will not be close to 2019 numbers, which was, which were like really a record-breaking year for us in terms of number of arrivals, okay? I can't give... Uh, Bernard or anyone uh, certain projections at the moment because they're, they're always being revised okay right. so uh, but but one thing is certain like I said it will not be in in the atmosphere of 2019 numbers that's for sure yeah I, I think it's uh, Bernard will understand why not then we have uh, uh, Christy from the United Kingdom uh, with Daryl James Travel. He's a travel consultant. 
will clients have to bring certificate for COVID free or tested at airport? Uh, is that being asked uh, for at any of the countries in Mekong? Uh, yeah, Charlie, I can comment on this one from Cambodia. Um, basically, we're one of the only countries that is just about letting people in at the moment, albeit with very draconian restrictions. And on a long shopping list of things you have to do, showing a COVID-19 certificate is one of them. So you have to be uh, tested in your home country 72 hours prior to arrival with a, a clean bill of health, a, a negative test. And then you can present that to immigration on arrival and uh, you, you'll, uh, then you're allowed to enter. You're good to go. And exactly. I think insurance, and next somebody else asked about mandatory insurance. Yeah, exactly. So that's another policy that basically because Cambodia came in for so much criticism for the $3,000 deposit that um, they've been sort of scrambling for ways to unravel it. So another policy they've come up with is basically working with a group of local insurance companies like uh, Forte and Infinity is to have a $90 mandatory three week insurance policy for visitors. So think of it like an extra expensive visa. You pay your $90 on top and then you're covered for COVID-19 treatment in Cambodia. So that may be a, a way forward for opening travel in, uh, in when they want to open up again in the region. Uh, Mark McFerrin from Ireland is managing director at Trip Makers. Is there an opportunity for dental medical tourism to open before mass tourism? Anybody want to take that? Uh, okay. Uh, right now, the country is opening up to medical tourists. Okay. Uh, but dental may not be that a high priority, as you can imagine. Uh, what I understand with the Ministry of Public Health, they are getting in the more serious cases, you know, the, uh, for the cancer treatments, for the surgeries, for the other stuff, okay? Dental may not be that high a, high a priority. However, what I understand is that uh, patients have the, uh, what, opportunity to request a trip here. Uh, I think uh, priority may be given if you are already coming here. You know, you're not a new patient. If you have been here for years and years and seeing a particular doctor at a particular hospital, then consideration may be given to you. But uh, that, that is just me, okay? So yeah, that, that's, that's the way it is. Well, hang in there, Kunchatan. The next question is also for you from uh, somebody whose name is Hash, based in Thailand, a retired uh, person from the tourism industry. Um, I, I live here in Thailand, I said it's my retirement home. Uh, my question is, when, if ever, and when, can all the countries offer hygienically managed restrooms all over the countries? Uh, this is the most basic requirement of any kind of recovery, especially after COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks. Well, uh, I couldn't agree more. You know, uh, as a tourist myself, you know, I look for clean restrooms wherever I go. And whether or not we're in COVID or not, I mean, it's, it's a really essential part of travel. Uh, having said that, the Ministry of Tourism and Sports, I know they have a, an ongoing program, okay, which in all likelihood is put on hold at the moment while they tackle, uh, you know, getting tourism back up to speed. But a program is there to uh, coerce or, <laughs> or get people to have clean restrooms in, in, uh, in tourist attractions. Uh, of course, nothing can be done nationwide uh, at the same time, but I know for major tourist destinations that is in place. And you're the popular one from Chatan. Mark, uh, based in Thailand, he's the managing director of Golf Asian, asks you, what is the Thai government doing to help tour operators? Okay. Uh, first of all, I know that there's a lot of pinned up demand for golfers, okay, to, to play golf. Okay. Uh, first of all, there is a plenty of 
of domestic golfing promotions at the moment to get ties to go out and, and play golf, okay, just to support the golf courses. For foreign tourists, we are ourselves buying vouchers from golf courses to give or do promotions with inbound travel agents, which hopefully they can sell in advance and get people to come to play golf when the country reopens. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, this concludes uh, our webcast, uh, part two of two. And based on the success of this short series, I'm sure uh, Jens and I will work to extend it. I mean, we have quite a number of months yet to follow uh, with the coronavirus development before all the countries will have opened up. So we want to make sure you in the travel industry are kept up to date on that progress. Thank you for having joined us. Thank you to our panelists. And uh, we'll be seeing you soon.